Well, as we head into the weekend, the threat, unfortunately, of nuclear war looms larger than at any point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Britain's defense minister says it would take as little as two days for Russian President Vladimir Putin to declare World War III. In the Wall Street Journal, Peggy Noonan writes, Putin may break the nuclear taboo in Ukraine. This nation's Kelly Meyer asking Pentagon spokesman John Kirby about the nuclear threat. Is there anything we're doing to show that we're taking it seriously, any deterrence? And does the Pentagon worry that Putin might look to use more low-yield tactical nuclear missiles in the battlefield? Yeah, we've talked about this uh, low-yield tactical nuke issue. I, a nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon. Um, and you can talk all you want about low-yield and tactical and all that. It's a nuclear weapon. It's a weapon of mass destruction. And it's a scary threat, and it is before us. Joining us for more tonight, retired Marine Intelligence Officer Hal Kempfer. Hal, good to see you. Good to see you, Marnie. Is this saber rattling by Putin, the nuclear threat, or um, how concerned should we be? Well, anytime you hear any discussion of nuclear weapons, everybody is concerned. And I can tell you that I have no doubt that everybody's looking very much at, at where, where, where are they, where's their, what's their level of alert or status of readiness. Um, nobody's, nobody's taking, a, taking it easy, but it does appear to be part of a pattern of hyperbole, uh, a lot of propaganda. And of course, you have to remember, this is about the last thing that he really has to rattle. His conventional forces haven't functioned. His economy is really uh, in a desperate strait. So the one thing he can go back and point to is we have nuclear weapons. And, and I do agree with uh, John Kirby. Once nuclear weapons are, are introduced, it changes everything. Have you been satisfied, Hal, with the White House's response to this point on the threat and how they're handling it? Well, I think they're trying to, if, you know, maybe initially they got, maybe too leaning forward on it. Uh, maybe now they need to better express how, uh, how serious they are about it. Uh, I think in downplaying it so as not to spread panic, they are not making it quite clear as to all the things that go on behind the scenes to make sure that this isn't a credible threat. Uh, I don't know about the two days thing. I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old cold warrior. Mm. I mean, technically he could just launch. Uh, that's still a capability they have. Right. And I don't think anything is out of the question. Uh, the other thing that we're following, Hal, President Biden um, and the weapons that we're sending to Ukraine, he's going to visit a javelin factory next week. Um, apparently, they can't make the, the munitions fast enough to send over to Ukraine. How big of an issue is this right now in the fight on the ground? Marnie, the production line issue is a huge fight. In fact, logistics, uh, it's almost become a war of logistics, our logistics versus their logistics. Uh, it's getting the weapons produced, and it's getting the weapons over there. We have significantly depleted our stocks of things like Stinger missiles, Javelin missiles. So, that's, so it's tough to turn a production line on from, from one level to a much higher level, certainly if the production line's been turned off altogether. So it's going to be a challenge. With that said, uh, there's other countries that have weighed in, like Sweden, the United Kingdom. They have production lines going. They have some very capable missiles. So it's not just our missiles. It's a multilateral thing. I think that's why you saw that 40 country uh, council get stood up to coordinate all these requests. So if there's a need and we can't provide it as quickly or in the numbers needed, maybe we can bundle stuff up so that they get what they need to, uh, to counter the Russians. Yeah. How the other thing that we have been paying close attention to is um, the idea that both Finland and Sweden um, really want to join NATO. And, and we're seeing signs of that happening. Um, do you believe that that would be the type of provocation that would entice Putin to do something more than he's already done? Well, what I believe is that Putin is going to say it's a provocation no matter what it is. Um, I think it's amazing. Uh, having, having lived in Scandinavia, uh, having spent time in, in both Finland and Sweden, this is a huge change to see them joining NATO, but it also shows the, the change in the strategic posture uh, that NATO has versus what Russia is doing. Uh, I think they'll see it's provocative. Obviously, there's a little bit of risk anytime you do any sort of change, but his, his underlying reason for invading Ukraine fell off of that NATO membership thing very quickly, which was really a non-starter. 
And what he really stated was he sees Ukraine as part of Russia and the Russian Empire. He didn't see it as a legitimate nation state. That's different from saying, oh, I don't want NATO to expand. Yeah, he goes back and forth. But I think uh, with Finland and Sweden coming in, I, I think it sends a very strong message to Putin. And frankly, he needs strong messages. Yeah, well, that's for sure. And he's getting everything he didn't want, right? More countries wanting to join NATO, more United States in Europe, uh, more weapons being sent into Ukraine. You know, the other thing through all of this, as, as we keep going further and further into this battle, is the bloodshed. And especially early on, the images we were seeing, Hal, of, of the dead bodies in the streets of Ukraine, um, women and children, it's been heartbreaking because we, we have seen it as, as if we're almost there, right? These images on social media. Um, it's clearly having an impact on, on people to the highest level. I want to play for folks at home uh, a moment today um, that we haven't seen yet from Press Secretary John Kirby. It's hard to look at what he's doing in Ukraine, what his forces are doing in Ukraine, and think that any um, uh, ethical, moral individual could justify that. It's difficult to look at the... Sorry. How we don't see that type of reaction from the Pentagon, from the White House. They're often so composed and they see things much worse than we do. Um, this was quite a moment. Well, it's, you know, military and, and, and frankly, there's a lot of professions. Journalism's one of them where we get really good at, 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 you know, tamping down our emotions because we have a mission. We have a job to do and we got to move through it. But don't think, and, and I'm sure it's affected you at times as well, don't think we don't feel what we see. It, it, it does impact us. And, uh, and you know, I've, I've never had a situation like that where I was talking in public like that where, uh, you know, uh, talking about a situation. But I will tell you, there are times you, you get off the podium or, or, or something and it, and it hits you. It really does. These are just horrific images. Of course, one of the things today uh, with drones and everything else is, and certainly with cell phones, we're getting images that previous generations just simply would not get in the same way. Mm -hmm. And we get it faster, we get it more vividly. It, it comes to us in a way, the way that they would see it, or if, if we were actually there. And I think it's a trauma that, that not only John Kirby, but everybody feels in some way, shape, or form. Right. I mean, it's one thing to read about war. It's a much different thing to see it play out on the device when you wake up in the morning and see what happened overnight. This is what war looks like. Retired Marine Intelligence Officer Hal Kempfer, that was a moment, moment of humanity from, from Kirby today. Thank you for your time tonight. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.